Wow. <laughs> Big house. This is wonderful. This is absolutely wonderful. I am here to welcome you to Baltimore City as a transplant. I was born and raised in New York City, South Bronx. <laughs> Then moved to South Jamaica, Queens, where all the jazz musicians yeah. grow up. And then as I um, began to be educated in that city from a family who were immigrants yeah. from the Caribbean island of Barbados, I was very clear about what I wanted to do, and that was to be committed to the arts. Of course, I was the weird bird in the family. <laughs> Nobody believed at that time that a little colored girl could make a life in the arts. I didn't care. I knew who I was, I knew what I wanted to do, and I was determined. I didn't know how I was going to get there, but I know that that was the journey I wanted to take. So, since I was raised with a depression culture family, and you know what that means, Waste not, want not, okay? You take what you have, you make what you want. If you don't have it, you must not need it, all right? If you really want it, you better work for it, all right? So I, at a very early age, under the direction of my mother, because I hated piano lessons, no disrespect to the musicians, <laughs> but I had an uncle who was a classical pianist, and they thought that giving me that culture would make a difference. Not working. So I won a little competition at third grade, a poster painting contest. And they finally said, OK, she's hopeless. <laughs> so my mother began to find little recreation center after school programs. She began to let me go to the Bible, vacation Bible school sessions. Anywhere where they had free art materials. We didn't have any materials to do art per se. But here's the irony. My parents, my father was a shipbuilder in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. My grandmother was a master seamstress. My mother was a healer. Everybody was a maker. Fast forward through my history. I find myself here in Baltimore getting ready to go to Johns Hopkins to do a doctorate. That was another shocker for my family. What the hell is she doing? <laughs> you know, what is going on? I said, I don't know, I'm on this journey. They gave me some money and it's my job <laughs> to spend it on this fellowship and I'm gonna major in the arts. Granted, I had come out of Queens College with a BFA as an artist, but then I got a grant to do a PhD. I went, why not? Okay, however, Hopkins got upset because I would not acquiesce to what was going on in the academic arena. Because what did I do? I got lonely for community arts. So I went over to the community affairs office at Johns Hopkins and I said, do you need help? They said, yeah, we want to put up an exhibition of kindergarten art and nobody will help us. I went, for every year that I was there, that's what I did and anything else they needed to infuse cultural arts. Fast forward, it's now the 70s. Things are popping in Baltimore. I come out, I have my doctorate. All of a sudden, they appoint me dean of graduate school. Ooh, it's like a Putney Swope, for those of you who remember, all right? <laughs> and here I am, out in the community, all right? And I am asked by my president, Fred Lazarus, why are you in the community? You're supposed to be here teaching. I said, I'm doing that too. However, my research focused on Jacob Lawrence. Jacob Lawrence was raised by the community. When I did my research, which is one of my principal areas, it became very apparent, and I called it as such. He never went to an art school, per se. He never got a degree. I said, he was educated by the University of Harlem, all right? So when I came here and I started to look around at all these artists, and I see my minutes going, but that's all right, I got it. I said, this is the University of Baltimore City. There were creative people everywhere. The first two creative people I met here was John Waters and Joyce J. Scott. Whoa. I said, I think I'll hang a while. All right? Before I knew it, Afram, Artscape, Creative Alliance, 
all right? Maryland Art Place, all of these organizations started to flourish. A little gallery called Chroma Art Gallery down on Druid Hill Avenue was the only place artists of color could really be involved in an exhibition. It's okay. I kept working with them. Wrote columns for the Afro-American newspaper, Creative Community, all right? I covered everything from Entezaki Shange at center stage to every artist who was having a show in any small corner gallery. So, as we move forward, we now have a variety of serious, continuous organizations. We have Make Studios, which deals with abilities and art. We have Womb Works. I am apologizing for all those organizations that I cannot mention at this time. Wait a minute, I do have notes. I did make notes. Okay? Arts Every Day, which is an organization at the Motor House under the inspiration of the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation, which has created two sites, Open Works, which is an incubator lab over on Greenmount Avenue, and Motor House on North Avenue as an arts hub to infuse and create safe, accessible spaces for artists. So when I was asked to pull this all together, we also have School 33. We also have the UB Blake Center. We also have the Bromo Seltzer Tower. We also have the help of BOPA, Baltimore Arts uh, Promotion in the Arts, and Visit Baltimore, who feed into this arena. So as I was asked to create an opening session, and they said, you know, you could do like a TED Talk. You know, invite artists for TED Talks. And you only have seven minutes, and I'm down to nine, eight, seven, six, <laughs> 